Let's talk about what uh, some job hiring sites are seeing in the backdrop of the government's official data. Joining us now to discuss is Irina Novoselsky. She is the CEO at Career Builder. So Irina, let's start with how you guys are seeing the labor market recovery on your end of the equation with a couple of months now of the non-farm payroll figures coming in below where Wall Street had expected. Yeah. From what we see, the unemployment numbers aren't really capturing the full dynamic of what's happening in in this hiring market. It's actually a really wide dichotomy. On one hand, you're seeing unemployment come down and still pretty high at seven, you know, a little under six percent, which is still millions of people unemployed. However, on the other side, we're seeing the highest job posting that we've seen really an all time high, meaning companies are looking for candidates and yet they're not getting filled. And this is the ironicity that is happening that I don't think we would have believed that this would be post COVID, the conversations were happening, but candidates are not applying to jobs. And we've been talking about it. And one of the things that we look at a lot is the NFIB index, and it is a 48 year high. 48% of small businesses can't find candidates to fill jobs. And the fallacy is, is that it's only unskilled labor. It's actually very much so skilled workers as well. Hey, Irina, it's Julie. It's good to see you. So, you know, what I'm curious about is less the posting side of the equation, because we've seen lots of data, including yours, that shows the postings are high and the filling of the postings part of the equation, because we keep trying to figure out, uh, is there a job shortage, right? What exactly is going on out there? What are you seeing on your site? Do you have a good insight into how many of those jobs that are getting posted are being filled, where they are, where they aren't? There's not a job shortage from what we see. What we have is a candidate shortage, and it's coming from a few different things. So it's partially from unskilled workers, which we've talked about, and it's all over everything that it's tied to unemployment and COVID and the returning back to the workforce. However, one of the things that we're seeing is the biggest population of candidates that fill jobs are actually switchers, people who have jobs today that are looking for a different kind of opportunity. And that is also a huge group that we're seeing just not participate in the workforce for many different reasons. Whether they're moving, we're seeing a lot more moving and people looking for different cities of employment. And as a result, they're a little bit more uncertain on switching jobs. They'd rather stay with the job that they're in. We're seeing that there's a whole generation that has left the workforce early. Pre-COVID, we had a five generation employment workforce. And we're seeing the one of the generations that was really close to retirement is saying, I'm just not going to participate. And throughout COVID, they took themselves out of the workforce. We're also seeing schools. Most schools are still in this hybrid environment that's really creating uncertainty for parents. And they're delaying changing, delaying going back in the workforce if they came out of it. And so the, the conversation is really taken with unskilled workers and the unemployment benefits. However, what we're seeing is about the same amount percent is not applying on the skilled workers as well. Irene, I, I was reading a story before we uh, came to air today on how JP Morgan just posted three or four jobs looking for folks in the cryptocurrency space. Are you seeing that sector absolutely blow up right now? We are seeing growth in it, but interestingly, we're seeing people not look for full-time work because of the NFT market. They're making side money and they're no longer looking to fill full-time hours. And so they're pulling back on the hours that they're looking to work based on what's happening in the crypto market. Well, there you go. I mean, if you uh, if you make money in your side hustle, it's not a side hustle anymore. It just becomes uh, the main hustle. Uh, Irina, we have about 30 seconds left. Uh, before I let you go, I do want to ask just quickly about um, work from home and what you guys have seen, if, if you can see, on how much employers want employees back, how picky employees are about you know, remote only type jobs and, and how that conversation from your vantage point, um, how that's evolved in the last few months. Yes, yes, and yes to everything you said. So we ran a lot of surveys and it looks like 73% of candidates want to have a remote work from home option. We're also seeing that about 53% of thousands of the companies that we've polled are offering a hybrid, which leaves a really big gap in the employment market of companies not being willing to offer, of those who can, an employment situation that's more flexible. And that is gonna be a big leading driver of candidates looking to switch. It's the number one thing that candidates are searching for. It's one of their key and main decision criteria for making a decision to switch right now. And a really big influencer to leaving a job. And the fact that only about 50% of companies are looking at it from a hybrid perspective, it's, it's going to be a driver in the talent war. 
Yeah, and it's uh, you know it's funny we were chatting in the break. We are uh, looking at our return to office, but no firm plans yet. And I think all this certainly factoring into how uh, our parent company is thinking about these future decisions to make on, on and where how we will all you guys are from. potentially to come well, back in the office or not. Well, I think, yeah, I think it depends, depends who you ask. Look, uh, on the other side of this screen, there's a lot of expensive equipment they came and put in my house. And I mean, I think this works great. So, you know, we'll see, uh, we'll see how, see what Yahoo thinks about that in the months ahead. All right, Irina Novoselsky, CEO at Career Builder Arena. Always appreciate the time. Thanks for jumping on. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. We've been talking about the jobs report and the sort of worse than estimated, but perhaps better than feared job gains that we saw last month, the gains of 559,000. I want to bring in U.S. Labor Secretary Marty Walsh, who is with us once again to talk about the numbers. Um, making progress, obviously, Mr. Secretary, on these numbers. What do you think, and our Jessica Smith is here as well, what do you think the administration is still in a position to do to get people, more people back into the work. So, so you, you cut out a little bit there, but I think I got the question. I mean, certainly, you know, the numbers today are encouraging. The last four months, we've averaged about 540,000 new jobs. Uh, we've seen a little bit of growth in, in wages this month, which is a good thing. We also saw this last week the largest uh, decline since pre-pandemic of unemployment, new unemployment claims. Uh, it, it shows that President Biden's economic plan is working. Uh, we've seen growth in leisure, hospitality, restaurants. Uh, we've seen growth in education, which is a good thing. Uh, but there's no question we still have ways to go. I mean, uh, we're still dealing with a pandemic uh, f from all of the job loss in the very beginning of the pandemic, the first couple of months. Uh, we, we still have a, a ways to go in this. Uh, but today's an encouraging, good, good report, a good, solid report. And we just need to continue to, 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 to build off this momentum. Hi, Mr. Secretary, Jessica Smith here. Last month when we spoke to you, you said you did not think the extra unemployment benefits were keeping people from going back to work. A month later, has your thinking changed? How do you think those extra benefits are impacting the labor market right now? Well, first and foremost, the, the benefits are impacting helping people that uh, are out of work or can't find work and, and keeping food on the table and roof over their head uh, and allow people to continue to try and get through this pandemic. Uh, we certainly, one of the last month, the, the largest place I heard of uh, concern of people not going back to work was in the restaurant industry and the hospitality industry. And, and this month's report shows that we had the largest gain there, as last month's report shows. And I think as we continue to move forward here over the course of the next couple of months, uh, I don't think that issue will be an issue. I think people want to get back to work. People want, want to be able to, to, to earn, earn, a living, earn a wage, I should say, and get other benefits. So I, again, I, I think that having this conversation right now, um, I think as we continue to move forward here, that conversation will be, will be behind us. And Mr. Secretary, does part of the problem here with folks not necessarily wanting to go back to, to work does that part fall on the doorsteps of corporate America? We're hearing a lot of companies coming out raising wages. They can't attract the workers, but the workers they do attract, in some cases, they're actually cutting the worker hours while they're trying to pay them more. Yeah, I, I th honestly, I, I still think that, you know, I, I'm, my, my job previously to this was the mayor, uh, and a lot of people that were out of work, uh, they lost, either lost their job or they were laid off. And as we continue to think about reopening Boston or any other city in America or any other town in America, as more people get vaccinated, as, as the numbers continue to go down, more people are entering the workforce. We're starting to see more people go out to dinner, more people to, to, to going away on trips. We're seeing more activity out there. And I think as that happens, more and more people w will get back into the job force. Certainly, it, for myself personally, you can't just flip a switch to get people back into work. I wish we could. We can't. But we, I want to see gains in all these different industries. And when you, when, when, you know, I, I look at these industries very closely right now, uh, and I look at, so for example, the construction industry this month, which had a loss of 20,000 jobs, and when you d dive down to it, we don't have the exact reason for it, but one of the reasons is probably because of material and, su material and supplies. The gains in, 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 in government, the gains in education is a good thing because, because the American Rescue Plan made investments in childcare and made investments in schools, and we're seeing more people go into school Back into, back into the classrooms, and that's where we're seeing the gains. So we still have a, a ways to go. One of your guests earlier, I think Emily was on, as I, I commented when you were off here, uh, you know, what she said was, was right in a lot of ways. You know, we still have, we still have a, 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 a way to go before we get fully out of, out of, out of, the, 
out of the pre-pandemic or get to the pre-pandemic levels. The one thing I will say is that President Biden's economic plan is working. Uh, and, and we've seen growth here that we haven't seen in the last 40 years in this country. If there is still a ways to go, are you concerned now that about half of the states have started dropping those enhanced unemployment benefits? You know, I think that that's a conversation that each governor is going to have to have in his or her state as we move forward here. I think that, uh, you know, if you're a governor, if you're a mayor, what you want to see is your economy moving forward. You want to see people back to work. You want to see industry going again. You want to pe see people shopping on Main Street. You want, you want manufacturing. If you have manufacturing in your district, if you have biotech life sciences, you want to see these industries move forward because that's about growth, not just in the federal, in the national government, but it's also growth in the local government. So I think that as we continue to make these investments, as we continue to to work collectively together. I think that's an important step moving forward. Uh, Secretary Walsh, it's Miles here. And, and you know, as you were talking about uh, your prior role as, as the mayor of Boston, I was reminded of a story uh, I wrote about about a month ago, which was hiring troubles up in that neck of the woods on the vineyard this summer. Um, you know, vacation spots are having a lot of trouble getting the staffing that they need. As you think about the pressures um, in those markets, uh, from you know how you see the labor market, um, how essential is it to get the workers that are needed for those economies that you know may have lost half their business or more during last summer when people just weren't as mobile as they as they hope to be this summer? No, you're absolutely right, and I think some of the problem that that we're seeing in the initial beginning of or the end of the spring, beginning of the summer, is that. Last year, a lot of these businesses were operating at a very small capacity, and traditionally, their seasonal workers that would come in uh, didn't have a place to work, so they didn't go to work. And I think that I've had conversations myself with, with different business owners in, in the Cape Cod area of, of Massachusetts talking about how do we continue to move forward. So again, I think a lot of those places are expecting a good summer. And, and again, what was exciting, to, well, we shouldn't say exciting, what was hopeful to me today was the hospitality restaurant numbers, because that's the, that's the industry and that's where the workers are that work in those different areas, whether it's in Boston or California or New York or across this country in the hospitality industry, that's where those workers are going to be needed over the course of the next several months. Of course, infrastructure talks are continuing today. The president has said now that he wants at least a trillion dollars in new spending. That's quite a bit lower than his original plan of $2.3 trillion. So what do you think this report says about what's needed most in maybe a pared down infrastructure package? You know, this infrastructure plan really isn't in, in response per se to the pandemic. The infrastructure plan that President Biden's laid out is really about the future of America, keeping us uh, more than competitive, keeping us at, at you know, the, the best economy in the world. And that, that was the plan for this. And, and the president has made it very clear from the very beginning that he wants to have a conversation with all sides, not just one side, all sides. And, and, and he's, 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 he's true to his promise right now. And he's having real conversations, as, as you reported yesterday, we're all having conversations with, with senators and, and Congress people from on both sides of the aisle, if you will, to talk about the plan. This plan that the president is proposing is not a democratic plan. This plan that the president is proposing is a plan for the American people. So that's an important aspect of it. And the fact that the president is, is, is really intent on having these conversations and is having them, I think, says a lot about who he is. And Secretary Walsh, finally, it's Julie here. I want to ask a bit about wages because, you know, those folks, the vacation areas in Cape Cod that are hiring people, we're getting anecdotal reports. A lot of those places are having trouble, right? And they're having to pay people more as a result. Good for workers. I'm wondering what you're hearing from the other side as well, from the employers, about whether they are getting pinched by having to pay these higher wages. So I missed half that question. Sorry, you, you cut on on me there. Sorry. Just the last part of the question. I heard about higher wages. Yeah, I'm just wondering what you're hearing from employers about having to pay higher wages and whether that's a problem for them. No, I haven't really heard from employers saying they have to pay higher wages. I think that, you know, what I've, what I've heard the biggest part was your previous question about making sure that there's enough people to work in those industries throughout the summer. And, and as I stated earlier, I, I think part of, part of the issue there is that last summer, pretty much all across America in high tourist areas, they were shut down or, or op operating at a very small percentage point. I think this year, lots of these places are opening up now and they're ramping up in such a quick way uh, that, again, I'm hopeful that today's numbers are showing that people going back into those areas of, of hospitality, leisure, and restaurants. Mr. Secretary, thanks so much for your time here this morning. Marty Walsh, U.S. Labor Secretary, and our Jessica Smith, thanks to you as well.
It's been a very interesting time for the Bitcoin community, I think, and that's what I'm hearing around the conference is, is kind of Elon tweeting again, sending some price jitters through the market. I mean, you've been going back and forth with them about this, the sustainability question's still there. What's your take right now on how important that is to where we go on the price level here? I appreciate Elon Musk. Elon continues to tweet. The price of Bitcoin continues to stay lower than it probably should, which gives all of the plebes the opportunity to buy up cheap Bitcoin. So thank you, Elon. I really appreciate it. Um, <laughs> Besides the price conversation, I think that what ends up happening is people are just misinformed when it comes to the energy consumption. Uh, there's two main misconceptions. One is the energy mix. I think that's kind of getting sorted out. People are explaining it. Uh, folks like Nick Carter are doing a great job kind of writing about uh, that energy mix and how it's evolving over time. But two also is uh, there's this belief that similar to the legacy financial system, uh, it's not a linear energy consumption story. So you don't need more energy consumption to serve more users or more transactions. It's actually a system where whether there's uh, full blocks or not full blocks, the energy consumption is actually pretty similar. And then you can also put millions and millions of transactions into a single block. And so I think that just as people learn more about the system, this will kind of just be a blip in the radar. People will forget about it. And five or 10 years from now, we'll laugh and be like, remember when no one understood this and they were all talking about the energy consumption? Yeah, and the other thing too, I mean, you know, we're at a Bitcoin conference, so it's kind of frowned upon to be talking about other projects out there. But what I've been watching is Bitcoin dominance, kind of the measure of Bitcoin's market cap relative to the rest of crypto. And that's down, I think last I checked around like 43%, which is down significantly from the beginning of the year, which people might point out, maybe that means more money is flowing into some of these other projects out there. What do you get in terms of the sense right now, maybe specifically to institutional investors too, big money, where they're looking at relative to where Bitcoin was in the last big bull market? Yeah, I think it's a complete mistake to look at Bitcoin dominance and to look at any comparison of Bitcoin to everything else, right? Bitcoin is going after a currency. It wants to be a global store of value and a medium of exchange. It is the winner there, right? And for a cryptocurrency, an actual decentralized currency, it has 100% market dominance. And that's important because Bitcoin specifically is going after decentralization. That is what it uh, holds above everything else. It holds it over transaction speeds, uh, cost of fees, all that kind of stuff. Decentralization is most important. Everything else is competing on throughput, fees, etc. And you're getting a lot of technical innovation, a lot of technical competition. But I think that's where there's a lot of questions still as to who the winner is and all those other con uh, smart contract platforms, et cetera. Yep. But Bitcoin is 100% dominant when it comes to a decentralized currency, and that's what makes it so special. And I think that's why you're seeing you know, tens of thousands of people show up here at this conference saying, like, this has won already. And I think it's just inevitable at this point, and the real question is just how long does it take to get global adoption? Yeah, and we, I mean, we're seeing that adoption too when it comes to that debate. Um, but when it comes to the next major catalyst, because we were talking about institutions coming in, there's that. We were talking about kind of it being used for transactions. So you can look at Tesla kind of accepting as a form of payment before they went back on that. But I mean, what is the next? big thing there that will drive Bitcoin higher because it seems like transactions or even the institutional adoption hasn't done much at the levels we're at right now. So what do you see as maybe the next most overlooked catalyst here? We started with retail. We then moved in and we started to get financial institutions. Then we got corporations. There's one group of people left and they're coming. It's the countries and the central banks. And I think people think that's a five or 10 year type conversation. I think that's a 2021 conversation. Uh, and so I think this year we'll see a country or a central bank come out uh, and go ahead and say, look, we've decided to go either purchase it, put it in our reserves, et cetera. You saw yesterday Russia decided to drop the dollar out of that national well-being fund. Uh, they didn't buy Bitcoin as far as we know, uh, but they decided to increase their exposure to other currencies, uh, also buy some gold. And so I think countries are just thinking about this, right? What should I be doing if all of a sudden the United States dollar has either some sort of censorship risk uh, or it's got some sort of macroeconomic and debasement risk. Uh, and so I think that naturally Bitcoin will end up in one of the countries. I don't know which one yet, but I do think that it'll end up uh, happening in 2021. Yeah, as you watched out uh, kind of the China risks we always see through kind of triggering some of the sell-offs. I mean, when you watch that play out and kind of the way that they've been taking a position maybe against similar uh, sustainability in question when it comes to mining, uh, seems to be a benefit, right? We talk so much about people here in the U.S. who are stressing that as a national security concern. Seem like it would be a reason to be bullish, even more bullish on Bitcoin. I mean, how do you see that playing out uh, when it comes to the U.S. versus China on that front? It's no secret. Uh, I lost 30% of my net worth in the last month. <laughs> I'm more bullish today than I've ever been. And the reason is because what we're seeing is the fundamentals are continuing to gain strength. More people are uh, adopting this currency. You're seeing more wallet addresses. You're seeing more transactions. You're seeing just the belief of this as a global store of value continue to take seat. But what you're also seeing is this kind of geopolitical uh, conversation play out where literally China's pushing uh, hash rate outside of their country. Um, it's pushing it to a more green grade. It's pushing it to kind of a more decentralized uh, aspect. Yep. And so I just generally think like when you look at the underlying fundamentals, forget price, Bitcoin 
Bitcoin has never been kind of stronger than it is today, and I don't think that people are really accounting for the fundamentals. They're all just looking at price, looking at tweets, uh, and they're getting caught up in the emotional sentiment. But if you can ignore that stuff and you look at the fundamentals, it's really, really hard to be bearish on Bitcoin right now. Yeah, I mean, but, and yet there still are. There are people who are bearish on Bitcoin. And Bitcoin's an intelligence test. If you're still <laughs> bearish, that, that, you know, you that, can figure out which side of the test you end up on. That is what we're hearing down here at the conference. But when it comes to maybe the risks that you do pay attention to, right? Because there are those out there, and Gary Gensler's getting set up at the SEC. There are things that maybe some people in the, in the crypto world fear. I mean, is there one that keeps you up at night that you're watching now? I think there's two main areas that I really spend a lot of time on. One is a self-imposed wound, right? So uh, there can still be a bug that would be introduced in the development process. I think the probability is near zero, very methodical process, kind of very, very intentional process, um, but still that it could be a potential uh, issue. And so we just have to be uh, vigilant and kind of continue to watch that. Yep. Uh, and then the second is not any sort of banning um, or anything like that. It's actually more regulation and taxes, right? And so what we need to do is we need to continue to educate politicians, uh, regulators, rule makers, make sure they understand this asset and it's really exciting to see there's multiple congressmen or senators or politicians that are here at the conference we literally have them with laser eyes on Twitter like it, it is working but we have to remain uh, kind of uh, dedicated to that effort because the more educated they are the better decisions they'll make the better decisions they make the less of a risk that becomes well, I know you got to run uh, you're off to your panel with the Winklevoss twins coming up here at Miami but Pompliano the man they call pomp Anthony Pompliano one of my favorite people in the crypto world appreciate you stopping by here to chat absolutely uh, thanks good so luck much out there be well uh, Julia we'll send it back to you here from Miami. Bitcoin right now is down. Uh, it's, it's trading at roughly, what have we got here? $36,977 a coin. But Zach Guzman is live in Miami at Bitcoin 2021, and he's got a guest who was in early with Bitcoin when it was what you could call cheap. Zach? Yeah, thanks, Adam. Fair to say, early with Bitcoin here uh, with legendary VC uh, and founder of Draper Associates, Tim Draper. Thanks for taking the time. Terrific. Thanks for being, for having me. Yeah, here. good this to see you great, again. Great to see you again. And you just came off the panel. You know, it's been a busy day here at the conference, but a lot of talk right now about where we're at in the uh, adoption cycle here. We don't like talking about price targets so much, but yours is up there. So I like to open with that. Uh, Two hundred fifty. Mine, mine's starting to get conservative. <laughs> uh, 250k by the end of 22, uh, or the or the beginning of, of 2023, and um, and my thinking is that uh, at that point people are going to realize that there is a better currency. They'll start being able to spend it maybe with Open Node at the at retail. They'll be able to buy groceries with it, and at that point it's going to soar because why would you ever hold on to a currency? that is fiat when you can own, hold one that's crypto that does everything else that yeah. the fiat does. Yeah, that's always one of the interesting things because it seems like uh, you know, you've had that price target for a while, you've been looking for 250,000, uh, and you're, you, it sounded like you were surprised that other things hadn't come along to knock Bitcoin off its track, and that's kind of, I guess, you know, one of the staying powers and one of the beliefs is no, that- No, I've always known that it was going to be very volatile relative to the dollar. Yep. In some ways you could argue that the dollar is very volatile against Bitcoin as it slowly works its way out of our lives and out of the system. But for now, um, yeah, it, it, it seems very volatile, but every big change in the world, every transformation uh, goes through fits and starts. And we expect plenty more to come, although I think the, the, the amplitude of the vicissitudes are going, is going to be smaller yeah, over time. Yeah, less volatile, and we're yeah. already kind of seeing that yeah. as we're sitting here in this range-bound $30,000 range. Uh, but let's talk about sustainability, because that's one of those things that we've heard issues uh, among institutional investors. Kevin O'Leary was talking about it potentially being a problem, and then we saw Elon Musk come out. Uh, as a VC, I mean, what do you look at that as maybe an issue that could be overblown? What are your thoughts on, on whether or not so it is? So I think institutional investors, um, they've been operating in dollars for a very long time. And they're, they're thinking, oh, this has always been our safe haven. Everything's been safe. Well, now they're seeing big rampant inflation coming. They're seeing people with a little less confidence in the dollar. They're seeing threats from digital yuan or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, they, what they're starting to realize is, as fiduciaries, they really need to take to get some Bitcoin so that they have some sort of a hedge against the inflation that's coming. Yeah. And uh, and many fiduciaries are starting to recognize that, but some will come in and go out and and they'll get political pressures or whatever pressures 
to, to leave the system or come back into the system. But longer term, we all know that this is going to, it's just better currency. And eventually the customer is going to recognize that it's just better currency yeah. to operate with a currency that is completely free and open and completely trusted. So it sounds like you are also kind of in the other camp, right? We've heard from Kevin O'Leary be talking about, I don't know, uh, that he wants to be certain his coins aren't blood coins, as he calls them, ones from China. Uh, a lot of yours came from the Silk Road. Ross Ulbricht, when you won that auction over, over Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean... free Ross. <laughs> Let's get him out of jail. I mean, the guy's an amazing entrepreneur. We need really? more entrepreneurs. That's the way you look at it. We need the world to have people who are out there willing to take risks and try things. And when you start, you know, putting too many regulations on people, too many, put, put them in too small a box, once the government controls everybody, you don't have that freedom and the free, and, and you end up more like North Korea yep. than South Korea. You end up with the government control and abject poverty and a miserable lifestyle instead of free and open yeah. and transparent Well, that's interesting world. because it's like, you know, uh, I mean, obviously there are problems with Silk Road in terms of what they were selling, maybe not necessarily the transactional currency they chose, right. Bitcoin, but when it comes right. to he that. Right, he was a platform. When it comes to that, I mean, are there are there issues around, it sounds like you wouldn't care where your Bitcoin came from, obviously, if you got it from the Silk Road. Some people would look at that as dirty Bitcoin, but to wait, you, there, it's, wait, there's Wait, I bought no the Bitcoin from the U.S. Marshal's <laughs> office. What are you talking about? Well, that's the where thing. Where do you get your... Aren't you in the media? Where do you get your facts? No, 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 I'm I saying- I bought that from the U.S. Marshal's office. No, 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 for sure. That's, I'm saying that that's right. the right way to go, and I'm saying that there's probably no distinction between dirty Bitcoin or clean Bitcoin or whatever, right? Wait, I don't know what you're talking about. Bitcoin is Bitcoin, and it is an extraordinary new currency. Yeah. And. Uh, I don't, I don't know where you come up with this weird thought of a dirty... No, 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 it's not my thought. Kevin O'Leary's thought was talking about it matters now when institutional investors are getting into this space. Yeah. They care where the Bitcoin comes from, whether it's a well, Chinese that's good, miner or a U.S. miner. Very, mine has just gone from one place to me. Yeah, and you So they know exactly where my Bitcoin has come from. Yeah. Yeah, so mine is probably, if I were... I, if I were, I'm never going to sell it because yeah. why would I? What would I sell it into? Well, listen, I well, why would I be sell the, the currency of the future into the currency of the past? You it's and I like are in the same taking boat here. Euros and buying drachma with it. Well, you something. guys are in the same. You and I are in the same boat. I mean, I'm, I'm <laughs> on the same page where it seems like there is a little bit of an overblown take in terms. But of I think Kevin's right. People are going to say, "Wait, this is a better asset class yeah. than fiat cash." Well, it's the same thing like if you're saying, oh, I want to be in cash, no one asks you where your cash came from, right? Yeah, it's interesting, but now, yeah, I mean, really, the, the criminal element has all gone to cash. <laughs> they don't want to use Bitcoin because there's a per perfect record of everything that happens on the blockchain. Exactly. Yeah, so that's what's kind of beautiful about the blockchain. You can see actually where your currency well, that's has why come I think, from. I mean, and that's good because you can have NFTs, you can have a lot of other these technologies yeah. that allow for, um, for people to have a, a complete thread to where things came from. That'll matter when you're buying your organic salad or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> and, you want to be more sustainable. Yeah, when because it comes you'll, to that, have I mean, this, you'll have this path and that path will come from the Bitcoin blockchain. Very exciting. To wrap, to wrap up, I mean, when you think about that, it sounds like we're in agreement that, you know, some of the, there might be some overblown risks when people look at risks to the adoption cycle. Uh, are there other ones that stand out to you as maybe one that could knock it off of hitting that $250 or $250,000 price target? The you mean other cryptocurrencies? Potentially that. There are or... always new technologies that come along. Um, but I, I do feel like we've standardized on Bitcoin. There's a lot of trading and whatever in other currencies, cryptocurrencies. Yeah. But, um, but I think the, I mean, you see from this incredible conference exactly. that Bitcoin is really the standard, and that is where most of us are going to go, but it's always great to have competition. Yeah. It's always great to have entrepreneurs doing interesting things with the new technologies that are out there. Yep. And if they're wild and interesting enough, then we'll back them at Draper Associates. Are you, so I mean, is there one other than Bitcoin? I know you're in a Bitcoin tie. I know we're at a Bitcoin <laughs> conference. I know it's maybe uncouth to ask about other projects that you're really into right now. Well, I love the ones that are taking, first, that have really brilliant teams behind them and are taking um, a new approach at something. So like Aragon is this really interesting token that's built 
juries. They're starting with juries mm -hmm. and they're reforming what the nature of a jury is. And that could actually lead us to a liquid democracy, which is, is takes humanity to another level. Yeah. I mean, all of a sudden, we've gone from being tribal to being global, and we've got a new governing system that's much more different. What about uh, Ethereum too? That's another one where some people might say it will always be. I don't want to. I don't want to keep quoting Kevin O'Leary here, but it's one that pointed to at the conference uh, that says Ethereum will always be silver to Bitcoin's gold. You're wearing a Bitcoin tie, but you also appreciate yeah, new I technology. I look, at, I look at Bitcoin as uh, the Amazon, and I look at all the other currencies as the. Um, the other e-commerce companies. So your advice maybe to be. investors would be take a chance, but not necessarily as big a chance on those. If you're building a portfolio, people are looking at it as a- People do. They have a nice portfolio of different tokens. A lot of them are just copies of Bitcoin, and I, I don't think that's worth it. Yeah. Unless they've got something else. Not a big Dogecoin special. guy then, I suppose. Not, yeah. a, not You're not so wearing you, a Dogecoin tie for a reason. No, although it, it's kind of interesting. Dogecoin has sort of taken uh, the imaginations of people a little, but but as I talk to my Uber drivers and stuff, they they say things like, "Oh yeah, Dogecoin because it's cheaper than Bitcoin," but they're not realizing that they can buy <laughs> fractional a small pieces of Satoshi's of some Satoshi's yeah. rather than buying this Dogecoin that has no support. I mean, no engineering support to it. Yep. So, I. You know. <laughs> it's one of the biggest misconceptions I, I think out there is that you can buy pieces. I think you want to go where the ones that have good engineering support. Yeah, that's an important takeaway yeah. here. And it's important coming from you too, legendary VC here, Tim Draper, founder of Draper Associates. Appreciate you stopping by here. Great, uh, my and pleasure. Talking with this it's is a really great fun. conference. People, gotta we're, come out we're here. In the, we're in the uh, the free country of Miami here. <laughs> That's right, and we got to put our fanny packs back on too. But Tim, appreciate it. Always love great. chatting. Uh, guys, we'll send it back to you in the studio. Amazon is in hot water again, this time with Washington, D.C., the attorney general filing an antitrust lawsuit last week against the tech giant for its policies around how third party companies can price their products. Carl Racine is D.C.'s attorney general and joins us now, as does Yahoo Finance's uh, Jess Smith for this conversation. And I want to just address the question to the attorney general in terms of this most favored nation agreement. That's the clause that's in question here. I guess for our viewers, can you just walk us through what that clause means, how Amazon tried to change that, and ultimately, what is the core at your lawsuit? It's a great question, and let me walk you through that. Uh, so my team and I in the D.C. Attorney General's office filed an antitrust lawsuit against Amazon for illegally abusing and maintaining its monopoly power. It controls anywhere from 50 to 75 percent of the digital mall, we'll call it, uh, by controlling prices across the online retail market. For years, Amazon has controlled online retail prices through its restrictive contract provision, sometimes called the most favored nations clause. Here's how it works. Amazon requires third party sellers to agree to severe restrictions to sell their products on Amazon's online platform. Third party sellers have to agree specifically that they won't offer their products anywhere else online, including their own websites at a lower price than it is on Amazon. These MFN agreements are widely viewed in the antitrust space as being contrary to competition, innovation, and creating higher prices. And so here's what we have. Amazon and a third-party seller make a deal. Amazon puts in about a 40% commission on the average item sold. That increases the price. Then that third-party seller is locked and can't offer a lower price than that. So clearly, that increases prices. And the only reason why Amazon can get away with it is because of what we allege is monopoly power on the internet. Again, 50 to 75% of the market. It's as simple as that. Let me give you two other facts that might be interesting here. That is that the UK and Germany investigated uh, Amazon for the same conduct back in the 2013, 2014 timeframe. Rather than confront those charges, Amazon ditched the practice. Then when Congress raised the concerns in 2019, Amazon promised to change its practice, but it actually didn't. It just put the same language in another part of the third party seller agreement. We're looking to put an end to this practice that raises prices on the internet.
Yeah, and you know, I wanted to ask about Amazon's response. Amazon says that sellers can set their own prices and Amazon has the right to highlight or not highlight products that are not priced competitively. They argue that the relief you're seeking would force them to feature higher prices. So what, what do you say to that response from Amazon? Well, I'm, I'm saying that Amazon is kind of speaking like a monopolist. The idea that sellers are actually free to set their prices um, is a myth because if the sellers wish to price their, um, their items at a lower price on other websites, including their own, Amazon's clause allows this, uh, them to punish the seller. Um, and so the idea that Amazon's practices creates low prices for everyone is wrong. In fact, what it does is it creates a high cost that will not be lowered, that ordinarily would be lowered if that most favored nations clause did not exist. You know, what have you heard from other states in the past week or so or, or other entities? Do you expect other state attorney generals to get involved? You know, I have um, had conversations with other attorneys general who've seen the reports of the suit and have reviewed the complaint. Uh, they're going to have to make their own decision at the end of the day as to whether uh, it makes sense for their office to either join the suit or bring their own suit. I've also seen a lot of coverage um, on the internet as well as in print journalism really highlighting uh, this practice of making prices higher with these most favored nation clauses. So I think the momentum is on the side of freedom on the internet, not restraint, um, and making the monopoly large player play a lot more fair. So to that point then, uh, curious to know how concerned you are about how limited the impact might be if you are uh, victorious, let's just say, in this lawsuit and you do win, considering that this lawsuit is being filed under D.C. law. It's not being uh, brought in federal court. It's not a, a federal lawsuit filed by the, the um, U.S. attorney general. And as you just mentioned, other states are going to have to decide if they want to participate in this lawsuit. So what will the ultimate impact be, do you think, if you do win this lawsuit? Well, it's a very good point uh, that we brought the suit in the District of Columbia in our terrific courts um, because we're protecting D.C. consumers. And normally in a case, you're right, a favorable judicial decision or a settlement is limited to the geographic area of the suit. I think here the practice that Amazon is engaged in is so broad and the scrutiny that Amazon is under. Remember, I mentioned uh, that um, Congress was really focused on this clause. Amazon essentially did a bait and switch on them. I think what this lawsuit is going to eventually result in is in Amazon changing its policy, just like they did when the UK and Germany um, you know, investigated them for this same conduct. You'll remember that the UK and Germany did that. Amazon changed its policy, not only in those two countries, but throughout Europe. So I think that this is going to be a, uh, a broad remedy, in fact, um, whether it's by a lawsuit or by an agreement uh, on Amazon's part, pursuant to settlement to change its ways. All right. Well, we'll have to see. And worth mentioning, by the way, that Amazon is trying to put up that new headquarters just outside in D.C.'s backyard in northern Virginia. But again, uh, AG for uh, District of Columbia, Carl Racing, thank you so much for joining us here on Yahoo Finance this afternoon, in addition to Jess Smith. A massive conference going on down in Miami, Florida, where some of the biggest names in crypto are gathering. So let's check in with Yahoo Finance's oh, Jack Kuzman, who's been busy all hour? day. He's been down there covering all the happenings at the Bitcoin conference, and he's joining us now with a special guest. Zach. Yeah, Brian, appreciate that. We just keep our live coverage here rolling here with Caitlin Long, the CEO of Avanti Bank. Thank you for stopping by. Uh, I'm very excited to chat because finally we're going to be digging, uh, digging into a very uh, maybe not talked about as much regulation piece of all of this, but it's pretty important. Uh, you guys there in Wyoming have made a lot of strides when it comes to regulation and doing it right as a bank. And people might say banks are bad when it comes to Bitcoin, but not the case. Talk to me not about what you've been working on <laughs> and uh, why people might think regulation isn't necessarily a bad thing. Well, anytime the U.S. dollar is involved, you're touching the banking system and you're touching, therefore, regulation. Yeah. And Ultimately, there do have to be on-off ramps between Bitcoin and the crypto ecosystems. 
back on and off to the U.S. dollar, and therefore you're touching the Federal Reserve ultimately, whether directly or, or indirectly, the Federal Reserve has a say in this. They have, up until recently, not said much, uh, but you're now starting to see a lot uh, being said, including recently by Chairman Jay Powell himself, talking about this industry, and it's all part of what is essentially a drip, drip, drip of almost every day something coming out of Washington, D.C. that's indicating there's regulation coming to this industry, but also doing it in such a way to give us optimism that it's not going to be too onerous. It's something that if you pay your taxes and you comply with the law, you're going to still be able to operate in this system. Yeah, that it's not a reason to panic. And you guys have proven right. that out, too. I mean, for years you worked uh, with Senator Lummis in Wyoming to kind of push for a framework that the nation can adopt. Um, talk to me about what you were able to do there, as you guys now have a charter, uh, and kind of proving out what it would look like on a national level. Well, sure. Uh, Avanti is a Wyoming chartered bank, but able to do business all around the world. Uh, so even though a state took the lead here, it doesn't mean that it's only for customers in the state. It could be customers almost literally anywhere in the world where a U.S. bank is, is, is recognized. But what Wyoming did was understood that regulation was coming and also in some degree was needed. No one really knows what Bitcoin is legally. Is it, is it property? Is it a stock? Is it a commodity? Is it money? And so Wyoming was the first state in the United States to step forward and give it some definition. What that does is give the businesses in the industry clarity to operate because you know you can get clear legal title to the asset yep. and you and judges have a roadmap to adjudicate disputes. This is not rocket science, but actually only one state in the United States has done this yet and yeah. it's Wyoming and that's why a lot of businesses are domiciling there. Yeah, and you levered all your learnings from a career on Wall Street too to kind of carry this over into the Bitcoin space. But when it comes to the other big aspect that we also don't talk about much, which I was excited to talk to you, was, was stable coins and the uh, important piece of the equation that's there. And Tether is one of those. And it's probably a good thing maybe to see the Fed talking about stable coins and introducing their own. But what do you make of that, given that it seems like potentially a risk there in bridging the crypto world with the traditional finance world? Because you kind of have to trust that Tether is $1, basically. Well, it's, it's so interesting because I think the Tether technology, there, there's, a, there's an old line that former Fed Chairman Paul Volcker used to say uh, during the financial crisis that there hadn't been any real innovation since the ATM was created. He said that back in 2009. And I think if he were looking at the world today, he would say there have been two real innovations in the last four decades and it's been stable coins and the ATM. Uh, stable coins are really powerful payment technology. The interesting challenge, though, is that, as we just talked about, they touch the U.S. dollar. Therefore, they touch the U.S. banking system. Therefore, the Federal Reserve has something to say about that. And yeah. we have started to see, uh, like, like we talked about, uh, Chairman Powell and um, Fed Governor Lael Brainerd also specifically speaking about stable coins, which uh, for those who are Fed watchers, definitely gives everybody a little bit of pause to say, okay, something's coming. Yeah. Uh, they're definitely sending in Fed speak a warning. Uh, but also, I think ultimately, getting some clarity around this is, is, is very good. Um, one of the big stable coins, USDC, has a big warning in its terms and conditions that says that the legal status of this is not clear, and it's not therefore clear, paraphrasing here, um, that transacting in this would be legally enforceable anywhere in the world. Yeah. Um, and so w when you're touching things like US dollar instruments, those, again, those very basic bricks and mortar, picks and shovels type infrastructure issues matter a lot. Yeah. And, and so ultimately, I think we will get some clarity here uh, just putting the puzzle pieces together from some of the things the Federal Reserve has said over the years. Yeah. They want it inside the banking system. Um, up until Wyoming created the special purpose charter, it wasn't possible to bring these things inside the banking system. And now we do have the Wyoming well, special purpose banks applying to the Fed to bring them inside the banking <laughs> and, system. And really, it's <laughs> positively a good thing for the end retail consumer here, too, because there are still questions around some of these institutions who are lending in crypto because they don't necessarily have to go through the same you know, watchdog 
things as banks, and obviously if you're saying a cryptocurrency is a stable coin and it means it's a dollar, and that's not necessarily regulated, that would present a rather big risk, I would assume, to the entire sector. Yes, that's right. And, and part of me, because I, I'm such a big bull on this technology, uh, I look at some of the practices from some of the intermediaries that have sprung up around this technology, most of whom are unregulated for exactly the reasons that you allude. Partly is that, that, that there haven't been clear pathways mm -hmm. to getting them regulated. That is the responsibility of the policymakers. They haven't opened up those pathways. So it's kind of like the internet in the, in the early 90s. Yeah. Um, everybody just did it and assumed that they would have to ask for permission later, maybe. But here, I think it's different with digital assets because you're dealing with money and you're dealing with consumer protection issues, and, and as a result, the regulators are definitely going to require folks to ask for permission instead of forgiveness, yep. uh, so to speak, and, and that, is, that is coming. Uh, and again, um, just reading the tea leaves from uh, the comments that have been pretty clear coming out of the Federal Reserve, get regulated, um, do this inside the guardrails that have been created, and a lot of it is, is very much related to consumer protection. Yeah. Um, I, I've been outspoken criti criticizing some of the intermediaries in our sector that have not taken consumer protection seriously. Yeah, and they're probably the ones that are going to get hit the hardest when some of these regulata re regulatory frameworks are imposed, but it's been fascinating to watch, and it's been very helpful to listen to you, and, and your tweets, often have been very good on the matter, too, but I uh, appreciate you coming on here to chat with us, the CEO of Vontae Thank Long. you. Thanks again. Let's start with the numbers this morning. What are you seeing in the industry? We've heard about the hiring shortages. Uh, how is that playing out in the industry? Well, and thanks for having me on. Hey, we, we are pleased to see the the jobs report, the jobs growth. I mean, it was a good start, but not good enough. You know, certainly not for our industry where we actually shed some jobs. Um, it's clear the pandemic is still creating problems. Um, you know, there's there's daycare issues. There's incentives for workers not to come back to work, to not answer job um, uh, vacancies. Um, we're looking to hire more people and not finding the workers that that want to fill those jobs. Um, you know, this certainly is a job crisis that's being perpetuated. Uh, and, and you can see also that a lot of folks are, have you know, really chosen to stay out of the workforce. Uh, so we're hoping that um, over time that will that will um, reset itself and we'll be able to get more workers um, so we can sustain our recovery as well. Stephen, from who you're talking with in your in industry right now, I guess, why do you think that is? Why do you think we're seeing such a gap between the workers that are needed and then the workers who are available at this point? Well, there's a there's a variety of things going on here. You know, workers are um, you know they're they're incentivized in many respects not to come back to the workforce. We've we've created an incredible amount of programs to help tide them over. Um, very important during the pandemic, but as the pand as we're coming out of the pandemic, we need to make sure that the incentives really favor workers coming back in. Um, over time, we're going to see you know daycare situations that are going to have to kind of right size themselves as well. Um, we're uh, we have jobs that. Um, we have available and we have benefits that are available to to really um, bring those workers back. One of the problems that we're encountering right now is um, the extraordinarily high cost of transportation. Um, big, big problem that we're experiencing, which actually minimizes even our ability to to hire more workers um, as much as we would like. We're, we're, we're paying um, uh, transportation costs that are 400 uh, percent higher than they were just a, a few years ago. Uh, again, another pandemic related uh, issue. Well, let me, let me follow up on that. Do you see this as transitory, as maybe the Federal Reserve has been talking about, or do you see this as something more persistent? And then if it is persistent, what can you do to mitigate the damage from it? Well, shipping costs right now are out of control. And, and again, this is, as I mentioned, it's built on the uh, some of the, the COVID-related uh, disruptions and delays that we've been seeing in supply chains for, for the better part of a year. Um, we're hoping that it will mitigate itself. Um, we're not too optimistic. We think actually this could get worse. Uh, and so we're calling on the federal government, the Federal Maritime Commission to investigate some of the pricing practices that, that go on with shipping companies as well as um, at the at the ports, um, because we're seeing these transportation costs show up both in, in um, delays at the ports as well as uh, increased shipping prices. And that's going to show up as really inflation across the board, not just our industry, but other industries as well. We're already seeing that. And unless this is addressed in the near term, um, this could really set in for a longer period of time. 
Um, another short-term tactic that can be taken right now um, could be to eliminate the tariff overhang. We pay extraordinarily high tariffs still, uh, tariffs that were imposed a couple of years ago during the Trump administration, um, but the Biden administration is still imposing those on us. Those are tariffs that um, are paid by the same group of companies that are facing these enormous shipping costs and challenges. If we could eliminate the tariffs, we could provide some immediate relief to some of those companies that are facing some of those transportation costs right now. Yeah, and Stephen, speaking of those tariffs, we know that President Biden it will be meeting with European leaders next week. What do you hope comes from that, uh, those discussions in terms of tariffs and what could potentially uh, resolve some headwinds here for your industry? Well, we think there's some persistent, there's some persi persistent um, uh, challenges that have occurred between the U.S. Uh, and the European Union, trade challenges over many, many years. We would love to see those resolved. Unfortunately, we've been dragged into a lot of those challenges where uh, where uh, both the Biden administration and in, in retaliation, the um, European governments are proposing to put tariffs on our products, even though we're not connected to the underlying dispute. Um, so we're hoping they will quickly resolve those underlying disputes so they can take tariffs, the threat of tariffs um, against their industry off the table. You know, one of the things that we keep saying is, is that we're not going to change behavior in other countries by raising the cost of, of, of prices for Americans or by making it more difficult for Americans to hire workers because they have to pay these ridiculously high tariff costs.